Καλησπέρα σα. Καλώ ήρθατε στο Καναδικό Ινστιτούτο. Λέγομαι Ζακ Περό, είμαι ο διευθυντή του Ινστιτούτου. Και είναι ω πάντα μια μεγάλη χαρά να σα έχουμε μαζί μα απόψε. Καλησπέρα σα. Καλώ ήρθατε στο Καναδικό Ινστιτούτο. Λέγομαι Ζακ Περό, είμαι ο διευθυντή του Ινστιτούτου. But, uh, I, και είναι ω uh, πάντα μια μεγάλη χαρά να σα έχουμε μαζί μα απόψε. So, um, 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 assistant Jonathan, uh, the, the, uh, καλησπέρα σα. Καλώ ήρθατε στο Ρόνιντα. Είμαι ο Ζακ Φερό, είμαι ο διευθυντή του Ινστιτούτου. Και είναι ω πάντα μια μεγάλη χαρά να σα έχουμε μαζί μα απόψε. Πάντα μια μεγάλη χαρά σε κορώνα να ξεχνάμε μαζί μας από Πάντα μια μεγάλη χαρά σε Thank <laughs> you. 
Did any of our project members meet an untimely demise on site? The Mirabello, Mirabello region is a tra transitional one situated between central and eastern Crete, bounded on the west and southwest by the foothills of the Jatayan Range and on the east by the Thrifty Range. Its southern limits are defined by the Scanavria Ridge and the Episcopi watershed in, in the Isthmus of Arapatra. The term Mirabella was also sometimes extended westward along the northern coastal plain to Sisi as the upper Mirabella. The region is punctuated by a series of river valleys running down from the mountains to the coast, which serve as catchments for the modern settlements of the area. The island of Sira and the village of Moklos lie at the extreme eastern end of the Mirabella region, while the bay itself links disparate valleys separated by rises in topography to one another. Kovanya is located on the northern outskirts of Ayas Nikolaos, on the coastal road leading to the modern city of Alunda. The seaward side of the road is being rapidly developed today, with hotels and luxury resorts rapidly multiplying in number. This route, which follows a natural contour against a slightly elevated plain to the west, was probably always the major north-south course along the western side of the bay, connecting it to the coastal plains around Milatos and Sisi in the upper Mirabello, and further afield to that around Malia as well as to the Isthmus of Arapatra to the east. Kavanya is also well connected to the broader seascape in that it possesses good natural harbors immediately on either side of the promontory. Indeed, it has clear lines of sight to the opposite side of the bay, including the island of Sira, and as far east as the Fanaromeni Peninsula, located on the outskirts of the modern city of Satia. Natural land routes, created by seasonal rivers, or Revmata, running from the Dicte Massif, provide an ease of communication leading westward to the interior of the island in the Lasithi Plateau. Kavanya is therefore well positioned to take advantage of both land and sea routes, which could connect the settlement to other areas of Crete. The eastern and southern shores of the Mirabella region have been the subject of intensive archaeological research since the turn of the 20th century. Indeed, this area may well be the most intensively explored region in the entirety of Greece. Notable excavated sites include Priniatikos Pyrgos, Vrocastro, Gornia, Vasiliki, Halosmenos, Catalimata, Castro, Azoria, Veranda, Chrysokamino, Psira, and Moklos, you get the idea. While limited scale rescue excavations have been conducted at places such as Calo Corio, Pefka, Alatsamoro, Alatsamori, Jalapa, and so on. And finally, three large scale survey projects, the Cavusi, Vrocastro, and Gornia surveys as well as two smaller scale ones in the Mesolari Valley and on Psira, have been carried out, providing crucial information on the settlement histories of their respective areas, as well as on systems of land use. The result of all of this archaeological work is that we have a fairly detailed settlement history of the southern and eastern Mirabella region, one which spans the Neolithic period to the modern era. 
The Bronze Age remains in particular cover the, full, cover the full spectrum of settlement type, including small farmsteads, such as those at Criso Kamino and Kilinamori near Moklos, sites of refuge, such as Catalimata, fortified sites, such as Aphrodite's Gefali, coastal entrepots, such as Moklos, Prineticos, Pyrgos, and Psira, industrial sites, such as Criso Kamino and Pefka, a palatial site at Gornia, and cemeteries and burials, such as the Latsamori and Pachiamos. The eastern and southern shores of the Mirabello also boast several early Iron Age archaic sites, such as those of Ro Castro, Veranda, Castro, and Azoria, through which we can examine early state formation that culminated in the rise of the Cretan polis. Despite the embarrassment of riches that fieldwork in the Mirabello region has created, very little work has been done on its western shores especially in and around the city of Ayos Nicolos itself. The polis of Lato is located about five kilometers west of the city, while on the opposite ridge to the east lies Thilakas 495, a Minoan site, which was once considered to be a peak sanctuary. The polis of Olus lays underneath the modern town of Olunda on the northern end of the western shore of the Mirabello. And moving into the upper Mirabello, one finds the long-lived early Minoan through Hellenistic site of Skinias on the coast. As for the Ayas Nicolas area more specifically, periodic rescue excavations undertaken throughout the city over the past half century, together with numerous chance finds recovered over the same period, have provided scholars with a solid, if patchwork, understanding of the Hellenistic and Roman eras. The pre-classical remains that preceded them, however, especially those of the Bronze Age, continue to elude detection for the most part. A pair of LM3C protogeometric burials set into a pie-shaped stone construction discovered between the villages of Dracos and Kalos Lacos, roughly five kilometers northwest of the city, and a number of LM3 figurines found with Hellenistic and Rome, Roman votive offerings in the cave of Tripatu Xarokambu in 1951 attest to later activity in the area. As for the Bronze Age proper, a small elliptical larnax containing an MM pithos and a decorated cup recovered from an unknown location in the city in 1951 is likely indicative of the existence of a protopalatial cemetery and associated settlement yet to be identified. The most substantial Minoan remains, however, came to light during the opening of a new road at El Avrico, about one kilometer from the city, where surface artifacts had previously indicated the presence of ancient remains. Portions of three distinct but incomplete structures dating to the middle and late Minoan periods came to light here during trial excavations in 2005. One, constructed of a mud brick superstructure atop stone foundations, formed two adjoining rooms and was associated with tripod cooking pots and open vessels, while a second consisted of three partial walls. In addition, a section of flooring a short distance to the south composed of small stones and a plaster matrix was associated with fine, fineware vases, tripod cooking pots, stone tools, loom weights, shells, animal bones, and obsidian. While the Bronze Age remains unearthed to date in and around Ayos Nicolos are admittedly, admittedly limited in scale and seem to correspond to typical domestic, funerary, and ritual contexts, they nevertheless constitute the most substantial collection of archaeological evidence for Minoan activity in this part of the Mirabello. Turning to the Cavania Promontory itself, there have been three rescue excavations conducted here by the Kappa Delta Ephraim of East Crete, the most recent of which has yet to be published. The first excavation was conducted north and west of the promontory in 2004 in anticipation of development of this area. This work succeeded in bringing to light the remains of fragmentary buildings dating to the Hellenistic and Roman periods. Associated with the material from these buildings was an unstratified deposit of Middle Minoan one to two pottery found within, collect, found within a collection of LM3C sherds. The absence of contemporary architectural remains, aside from a possible MM wall fragment, and the combination of earlier and later, later pottery in the deposit led the excavator to suggest that the material had either been disturbed by later activity in the area or had been moved naturally or manually from the nearby promontory. In 2016, further trial excavations were conducted immediately below the summit. Eight trenches yielded substantial standing architecture, a, a short section of an east-west running cobbled street, and part of a large terrace or retaining wall, 
as well as pottery spanning the early through late Bronze Age. Though these projects have yet to be studied in detail, the material they produced, along with the top courses of walls visible across the site, testified to considerable building activity in the past. In light of the foregoing information, well, except for the Saracens, they didn't really play any part in this, we decided to conduct studies at the site. Our intent is to fill in the lacuna in data for past activity in this little studied part of the Mirabello region especially in light of the rapidly disappearing archaeological landscape. We would suggest that like Moclos, Psira, Gornia, and Perniatigos Pyrgos, Cavania was a crucial hub through which goods, people, and ideas passed during the Bronze Age and beyond. Indeed, we hypothesized that the site was one node in the local Mirabello interaction network, which was itself linked to the broader uh, Cretan and Aegean one. Like the other coastal sites in the Mirabello region, Cavania linked the outside world to the interior of the island through easily traversed overland routes. Thus, in sum, we believe that Cavania provides a good opportunity to study both intra- and inter-island connectivity and exchange. There were three basic goals for our program of research, including first, the creation of a topographical plan of the promontory, second, the documentation of all architectural features, and third, the collection and analysis of portable objects visible on the surface. Beginning with the first goal, we decided to create a topographical plan of the promontory because the resolution of the existing Greek military mapping agency map, not to mention freely available satellite data, is far too low, and as a result doesn't capture the necessary information. Our new topographical map of the peninsula now serves as the basis for all future work at the site. Prior to beginning the collection of data, we shot site datums spread across the site with a, D, uh, with a DGPS using the WGS 1984 UTM 35N coordinate system. These points serve as the primary benchmark datums upon which all spatial measure, measurements were referenced. Our topographic survey included the promontory itself and the bottom land immediately to the west, an area of around 11,000 square meters. Using a total station loaned to us by the INSTAP Study Center for East Crete, we collected spatial measurements at five meter intervals in accordance with local topography, including the bottom land, the slopes, and the summit of the promontory. In some instances, we had to deviate from our system of recording owing to factors such as overgrown vegetation and a concern for safety, especially on the steep craggy slopes on the seaward side of the promontory. During such instances, we took spatial measurements where we could. We uploaded all data into a special database and processed it using GIS software in order to interpolate contours at intervals of 0.25 meters. From these, we generated digital terrain and digital elevation maps, models, excuse me. Uh, the contour maps, DEMs and DTMs, serve as the starting point for more detailed analysis of the settlement. Our second goal was the documentation of all architectural features on the promontory. These features were detected using two methods, field walking and remote sensing using a drone. Once identified, we provided all features with a unique number. These features fall into one of three broad categories. First, the remains previously uncovered by the Kappa Delta Ephrod excavations. Second, ancient features observable across the site. And third, more recent terrace walls. As we documented each feature, we input relevant information into standardized field forms, including feature type, context area, the material and fabric of the masonry, dimensions, and any associations to other architectural features, as well as a general description and all photograph and plan numbers. This information was then entered into a site database, which allows us to quickly compare categories of information and identify meaningful patterns of distribution. In the field, we employed two basic strategies to draw our architectural features, depending upon the category to which they belonged. We created stone-by-stone -stone plans of all features identified through our survey, as well as those exposed by the EFRI excavations that were not considered modern terrace walls. Using a total station set up using our site datum points, we captured spatial data in a series of points which were labeled around the circumference of the tops of every other stone along both exterior and interior faces. After the labeled point data was then printed out at a scale of 1 to 25, 
we return to the site to draw the stones, referencing the labeled points on both the features and the printouts. We believe that drawing architecture in such a way is a more accurate and less time consuming and results in information that's easier to integrate into larger site plans than traditional methods of architectural recording. We did not produce stone by stone plans of modern terrace walls. Instead, we created line drawings by collecting spatial data along the tops and bottoms of both wall faces at intervals of about 20 centimeters. Once features were drawn, they were digitized using GIS software. We then incorporated these into our topographic map, a relatively straightforward task since we'd already captured the spatial data during the drawing process. The result is that both the natural and social dimensions of the site are represented on our plans, which does allow us to study the relationship between the two, a relationship that we feel is important since surface topography has a direct impact on human processes such as building. During the 2021 field season, we cleaned several architectural features that we had identified in 2019 and others that were newly detected that summer. The decision to clean certain features was based on one or more of a combination of the following objectives. To determine the type of feature, to reveal its outer and when appropriate inner faces, to reveal stretches of walls that potentially communicated with other features, to correct or adjust drawings, and or to provide general information. To clean the walls, we removed loose soil and vegetation from the top courses and faces when applicable using trowels, small mattocks, and brushes. Any new information produced from this cleaning was appended to our existing database. As we were cleaning features, we recovered artifacts, typically pottery and groundstone implements. We placed all objects in bags and labeled them with a feature designation that we were currently working on. These objects were brought to the I.S. Nicolaus Museum at the end of each day for registration and storage. When preservation permitted, we extended our program of architectural documentation with a view to creating high-resolution image-based models of extant architectural features. This was especially relevant for the architecture in the Ephoria trenches, which we documented in 2019. Our basic methodology for this part of our recording program was to establish a series of control points in and around each feature tied to our site datums. These control points were used to geo-reference the image-based models, allowing us to situate them in real space and to incorporate them into our topographic model of the site. Next, we walked around the circumference of each feature and took a series of overlapping photos with the DSLR camera. We then post-processed the photographs and geo-referenced them using the semi-automated PhotoScan software Agisoft LLC. We did so in order to create ortho images, to extract a three-dimensional point cloud, and to render a mesh from which we can compute various other models. Our justification for such a program is based on the fact that architecture is emphatically three-dimensional, and it is built into varying topography. The photogrammetric models does provide us with the opportunity to shift away from presenting both topography and architecture as schematic two-dimensional conceptual constructs. Since the ortho images and models are more detailed, more complete, and more subtle than traditional line drawings, they serve as useful tools for understanding both the architecture itself and its relationship to its local environs. Moreover, they preserve sufficient data for other scholars to check our interpretations and they can serve as important tools for public interpretation, conservation, and historic preservation, an important point given the rapid development in the area and the environmental threats posed to the site. In addition to our program of terrestrial image-based modeling, we also instituted one of low-altitude drone-based photography and image-based modeling. We did so for the purposes of archaeological prospection and visualization. With respect to the former, the aerial photography provided us with a bird's eye view, aiding us in detecting and identifying features. This was especially helpful given the complexities of the landscape. For the image-based component, we captured a series of overlapping photographs of the entire promontory at an altitude of 30 meters. Over 500 aerial images were taken over the course of the 2019 and 2021 seasons. As was the case for the terrestrial image-based modeling, the photographs were lined in PhotoScan and ortho-rectified using special, spatial data from ground control points. The resulting model was generated automatically with some points adjusted manually. Photorealistic textures taken from the photos were overlaid on the model and an ortho-image was created. 
Working from our DEM and orthophotos, we generated a point cloud, which we used to create a three-dimensional model. We extracted realistic textures from the orthophotos and added these to the model. The third component of our research program revolved around a limited field collection of artifacts in 2019. This was supplemented by a more intensive pedestrian site survey approach in 2021. The survey was conducted with a view towards determining the general, general settlement history of the site to determine spatial patterning, specifically as it pertains to defining the site boundaries for each period of use, and to establish a comprehensive ceramic profile and sequence. To complete our goals, we divided the site into eight areas, labeled A to I in 2019, and then 17 areas, labeled 1 to 17 in 2021. The dimensions of each area were determined by local topography. Individual terraces, for example, comprised one area. Team members walked transects within each area, side by side, spaced one meter apart. As they were walking, they scanned the ground for artifacts and picked up all identifiable ones. These were then placed within bags carried by each team member. Once an area had been completely surveyed, the artifacts were combined into one bag, labeled, and at the end of the day, brought to the Ayos Nicolás Museum for storage and future study. As to the results of our two seasons of fieldwork, by far the highest quantity of data we collected pertains to architecture. In 2019, we documented the presence of 35 individual built features at the site, exclusive of those excavated by the EFRIA in 2016. In 2021, an additional 42 definite and 53 possible architectural features were identified, the latter of which were left unrecorded because they consisted of single stones or were only minimally visible. Proper excavation is required in order to determine their true nature. In 2021, we also cleaned 24 architectural features, including 19 previously identified ones and five newly recorded ones. These features were all drawn, photographed, and integrated into our overall site plan and DEM and slope maps. To date, therefore, 77 architectural features, nearly all of which may be identified as walls, have been located and fully documented on site. Most extant features were identified on the western and northwestern slopes, while several others can be found on the southeastern slope. Few remains were found on the summit since it's heavily eroded. It should also be noted that walls on the northern slope with exposed northward facing faces have suffered damage because of the aforementioned erosional activities. We believe archaeological features in the western flatland may be buried by deep deposits of sediment. In general, the walls have been constructed from locally available materials, principally limestone tripolitsa, which seems to have been quarried from the eastern side of the promontory. In this area, there appear to be many quarry cuttings on a shelf of this material. Two stones, each measuring roughly 42 by 70 centimeters and circled on these images, have been roughly hewn but remain unattached from the quarry face, resting in situ. The identified walls at Cavania typically consist of a mix of larger and smaller boulders, often packed with smaller stones and cobbles, as, as on the left here, where you see walls four and five. In some instances, though, as in the case, case of walls 11 and 12, which you see on the right, the largest stones within a wall measured greater than 50 centimeters in any one direction. For the most part, architectural features were oriented in accordance with local topography in that they follow the natural contours of the site. In very few cases, walls were oriented with disregard to topography. When two faces were observed, the widths of the walls could be substantial. Walls 15, 16, and 17, for example, which you see here, possess an average width, width of 1.4 meters. Stones were typically placed with flat edges outward, which created a unified outer facing, as you see on the left here, with wall six. In rare cases, as in the case of wall five on the right, boulders were hammer dressed to achieve this effect. Usually, only one course at current ground level was visible, but in some instances, as in the case of Wall 17, walls were preserved to a height of two or three courses above ground level. Wall 17 is also one of three walls, including Walls 8 and 28, that possess a projecting plinth course. 
Given the current evidence for damage to the northward facing exteriors of walls on the north slope, as, is, as in the case of wall 17, the use of a projecting course may have helped to stabilize these walls in antiquity. Partial outlines of at least three independent buildings have been identified on the site. The remains of one large structure comprising walls 15 to 19, 39, 40, and 58 can be seen on its northern slope. Though only partially exposed, walls 15, 17, 19, 20, 39, and 58 all appear to be roughly aligned on an east-west axis, with walls 16, 18, and 40 running perpendicular to them. At present, we estimate the measurable extant area of building A to be roughly 100 square meters, although it's rather likely that this value represents a significant underestimation. The northern facade of the building, consisting of walls 15 through 19, is impressive, with a maximum width on the northern facade of about 1.8 meters, and as I said before, an average width of approximately 1.4 meters. Walls 17 through 19 are well bonded, clearly indicating that this part of the building was built in one phase. In addition, as mentioned above, wall 17 sits on, a, sits on a projecting plinth course. Finally, as wall 15 abuts wall 17, it's clear that later additions were made to this edifice. A second building comprised of walls 8 through 13, 33, 34, 38, 42, and 47 appears just below the summit of the promontory on the north side. This building, whose extant measurable area is roughly 116 square meters, appears to have at least two building phases, as wall 42 abuts wall 8. Wall 3334 is an unusual architectural feature, consisting of two rows of stones, one immediately behind the other, each with flat, finished faces on their northern sides. These may be part of a series of risers, perhaps providing access from the summit of the hill to its northern side and to this building. Finally, a third building, comprised of walls 3 to 6 and 35, could be seen to the north and west sides of the site's summit. This building, which measures circa 143 square meters in extant area, making it the largest of the three structures, appears to be multi-phased, as walls 5 and 6 clearly abut and are not aligned with walls 3 and 4. It seems likely, therefore, that they're later additions. It's also likely significant that there's a roughly three meter difference in elevation between the east end of wall three and wall 35, suggesting that this structure may well have been multi-storied. The architectural remains identified by the survey and from the Ephraim excavations thus testify to the presence of several monumental buildings, perhaps official structures, which advertise the power and authority of prominent members of the community. Additionally, the dimensions and orientations of some walls suggest that they also served as retaining walls, the presence of which may well be indicative of substantial efforts to modify the local terrain. Indeed, as observed at other sites within the Mirabello region, such as Azoria and Gournia, their presence may also be taken to be indicative of some degree of civic planning, a situation to which the possible presence of several streets also testifies. That a planned settlement should be founded here is of no surprise, given that it possesses two well-protected harbors and is situated on both the major overland and maritime communication routes. Unfortunately, at present, without proper systematic excavations, we cannot determine whether the buildings uh, at the site are all contemporary. The difference in orientation between some buildings and individual architectural features, though, does suggest that this is not the case. Likewise, it's clear from the Ephraim excavations that some features are not contemporary, as one of the walls in trenches two and three was founded at a higher elevation than others from the area, which suggests that this wall is later in date. This conclusion is also supported by the markedly different construction exhibited by this wall when compared to the rest of the features in the area. Turning to the final component of our research program, our pedestrian surveys yielded some 2,017 shirts, 414 collected during the extensive survey of 2019, and 1,603 in the intensive survey in 2021. While preliminary study was conducted by Agnieszka Kalashevska, Kapua Iao, and Charles Sturge in 2019 and 2021, in-depth analysis of this material was only begun in 2022. 
The goal of this activity was fourfold. One, to, to create a refined site history. Two, to establish a ceramic profile for the site during various phases of occupation, one based on general morphology and fabric composition. Three, to provide a ceramic template for future studies in this part of Crete. And four, to develop an understanding of both inter and extra island contact and exchange. Study of the ceramic assemblage was undertaken by R. Angus Smith of Brock University, who processed and studied the prehistoric sherds with the aid of six undergraduate students and one research assistant from the Department of Classics and Archaeology, and Jane Francis of Concordia University, who analyzed the historic material aided by five undergraduate students from the Department of Classics, Modern Languages, and Linguistics. Despite limitations imposed by the relatively poor state of preservation of the assemblage, Smith and Francis were able to construct a rough chronological profile for site activity that spanned both the prehistoric and historic eras. Proportionally, the neopalatial, to which we attribute buildings A through C, the postpalatial, and the Roman periods dominate, while the early Iron Age period that bridges the prehistoric and historic eras is not represented at all. Of the 2017 sherds we collected, Smith was able to assign only 80 to the prehistoric era with confidence. Despite their small number, the date range they reflect, that is the late pre-palatial through post-palatial periods, is entirely consistent with the ceramic collected from the Ephraim excavations. Predictably, the majority of our diagnostic sherds, 59 of 80 or 74%, fall into the late Minoan category amongst which 28 or 35% are LM1 or likely LM1, and 22 or 28% are LM3 or likely LM3. Only very, only very small percentages of the diagnostic sherds fall into other specific ceramic phases. This assemblage was dominated by fine tablewares, which represented almost half, 48% of the total, followed by cooking wares at 24%, storage wares at 21%, and other. Because of the poor condition and fragmentary nature of the pottery assemblage, special emphasis was placed on macroscopic fabric analysis. Of particular interest was the discovery of a new courseware fabric, tentatively called Cavaniware, that was frequently observed amongst the prehistoric shirts. This is a red courseware fabric, so named because it seemed to be more frequently encountered than any other specific type of coarse cookingware fabric at the site. It's therefore suggested that this is a locally produced ware, or at least one produced somewhere in the region of the Western Mirabella. It's perhaps significant that all cataloged examples come from LM1 and LM3 cooking pots. Two additional fabrics were represented in the assemblage, one phyllitic and one granodiuretic. The former was present in both storage and cooking vessels dating to the neopalatial and postpalatial periods. In total, 12 examples were cataloged, with roughly equal proportions coming from LM1, all of which were cooking vessels, and LM3, which were bowls and pithoi. While local manufacture of these wares cannot be ruled out, it should be noted that major production centers for such fabrics existed during the neopalatial period at nearby Moklos, on the opposite side of the bay, as well as sites on the east coast of the island, such as Palikastro and Catazacros. It seems probable, therefore, especially given Cavania's strategic position along major maritime and land trade routes, the trade with sites in eastern Crete was thriving during these periods. With respect to the granodiorite fabrics, only four examples were cataloged, including an LM1 and an LM3 cooking pot, as well as a flaring bowl and a storage jar of uncertain date. The rarity of such fabrics compared to phyllitic fabrics is somewhat surprising, since the primary source of granodiorite lies just to the east of Cavania along the southern shores of the bay. In fact, at, major, at nearby major sites, such as Priniatigos Pyrgos and Gornia, it is by far the dominant fabric type. Reasons for this disparity may lie in ancient trading connections and patterns, although given the nature of our sample, it's also possibly the result of underrepresentative selection process, patterns. Excuse me. In other words, since granodiuretic fabrics are less chronologically diagnostic, it's possible that they were selected less frequently for cataloging. One prehistoric sherd, found right in the center of building A, the large bastion, deserves special mention. 
This is a fragment of a stem and base of an LM2 Ophirian goblet. The stem is hollow and the base hollow and splayed. The fine clay is a much paler buff color than most of the Minoan finewares thus far analyzed at Cavania. The surface treatment consists of a smooth buff self-slip. A characteristic LM2 band of lustrous dark brown paint runs around the bottom of the stem and top of the base. This is a definite import, most likely of Canossian manufacture. A close parallel for the dark brown linear decoration at the top of the base can be found from the unexplored mansion, while size equivalents are noted at the same site and from deposit 2 in well 605 at Palicastro. Here, we note the churge of definite LM1B and 3A1 date have been found in our survey, suggesting some degree of continuity across periods of the site. Without proper excavation, we cannot, of course, speak to the nature of the settlement history. Was there, for example, a final LM1B destruction, followed by a period of site abandonment and reoccupation, as we see at other sites across the Bay of Mirabello? Whatever the case may be, our finding certainly fits a pattern observed in recent years, wherein imported Ethereum goblets have been found at sites in East Crete, including Moklos, Petras, Palicastro, and Zakros. More locally, within the Gulf of Mirabello itself, it's notable and perhaps significant that such a phenomenon has not been noted for the sites of Priniatigos, Pyrgos, Gornia, or Psira. Indeed, no pottery of LM2 date has been identified at any of these sites. Moreover, Gournia, following a short period of abandonment, was the only one that seems to have been reoccupied after the LM1B destructions. France's study of the historic pottery from the site was slightly more fruitful, yielding a total of 150 catalog sherds. Unfortunately, chronological information was again rather slender. For the Roman period, the Eastern Sigillata A bowl fragment on the top left shows use of the site minimally from the late first century BCE onwards, but several sherds, as for example the beehive fragment to its right, also seem to belong to Hellenistic, if not earlier, vessels. Cretan transport amphorae, as for example the next one to the right, date to the second and third centuries CE, although these are only the manufacture dates and their period of use may be later. Some additional vessels appear to be even later, perhaps Byzantine. For example, two fragments of green glazed, green glazed vessels, one of which is pictured in the top right, which were only identified with the aid of a dynolite microscope. The manufacture and hard firing of other fragments suggest a similarly late or post-Roman chronology. Interestingly, study of the shapes of the Roman pottery from Cavania revealed an intriguing pattern one quite different from that evident in the prehistoric assemblage, namely the almost total absence of the fine decorated tablewares that typically characterize Roman pottery assemblages on Crete and elsewhere. Instead, plain tablewares are more common, mostly preserved as small handles belonging to closed vessels, everted rims, and thin body sherds, examples of which you see on the bottom. These no doubt came from small bowls, cups, and other shapes used for eating and drinking the place of which in the life of Cavani remains unknown. Indeed, the site at present doesn't seem to have been the location for elite habitation or lifestyle if imported finewares could be taken as such an indicator. Macroscopic fabric analysis of the historic era pottery revealed fairly homogeneous fabric data. The main fabric used across multiple function and shape classes is not dissimilar to that identified by the nearby Vro Castro survey project. This is a quartz-based fabric with both milky and glassy varieties, somewhat similar to the Cavani ware fabric identified in the prehistoric assemblage. Red serpentine was recognized within the historic fabrics, as was hornblende, feldspar in varying colors, quartz feldspar, red to red orange siltstones or clairstones, and granodiorite. Interestingly, for historic era pottery, only small amounts of granodiorite were recognized perhaps indicating a separate clay source just on the border of the main granodiorite area. One significant feature of this fabric is its lack of both calcareous grits and mica. In fact, only two studied fragments were extremely micaceous, and one of these, illustrated on the bottom right, may actually be an import. In addition to the ceramics, 12 groundstone objects were identified, including six querns and six hammerstones. 
Four of the quarns were fashioned from locally available materials, including limestone and metal limestone, while two were constructed from sandstone, whose source remains unidentified. Three of the quarns, including 21100, which you see in the top center, were strategically manufactured in that their sides and lower faces were hammer dressed, while the remainder bear no evidence for modification beyond the working surface on the upper face. In all cases, the upper faces are concave and bear evidence for abrasion completely to the edges. Interestingly, all of our quarns are fairly small, ranging in length from 10 to 21 centimeters, suggesting that they were not utilized for grinding grain. Instead, they could have been used to grind small quantities of materials, such as herbs, spices, nuts, or seeds, in which case they may have served as supplementary kitchen implements. Equally possible is that they were used for non-food production-related tasks, such as mixing paints, medicines, or in metallurgy to extract mercury from cinnabar. The six hammer stones were also fashioned from locally available materials, including both limestone and metal limestone. Only one on the bottom left is complete. All of the others exhibit heavy percussive damage on at least one end that's usually resulted in significant breaking and cleaving. The hammer stones are all expedient tools bearing no indication of strategic modification. In addition, 14 chipstone objects were also identified, including nine pieces of debitage, one primary flake, two secondary flakes, and six tertiary flakes, and five tools, all prismatic blades. All of the chipstone objects, with the exception of one flake of brown chert, were of obsidian, likely from the island of Milos on the basis of macroscopic inspection. The source of the chert, which seems to be of high quality, cannot at present be identified. Given that this assemblage contains objects from most stages of production, i.e. primary, secondary, and tertiary flakes, as well as finished products, i.e. prismatic blades, it's likely that the tools were being produced on the site. In addition to stone tools, we also collected pieces of worked pumice, mud bricks, and bone, as well as a Minoan loom weight, several Roman roof tiles, and for something completely different, one fragment of a World War II era mortar shell. Again, though, no Saracen gold. Perhaps most surprising was the discovery of a talismanic seal stone during our 2019 extensive survey. The seal stone, which measures 1.5 by 1.0 centimeters and is made of green jasper, was recovered on the southeastern side of the promontory in area G. It's an amygdaloid intaglio that depicts a series of eight crescents arranged in three rows, consisting of three, three, and two crescents respectively. A circular notch appears atop the rows of crescents. The seal stone is perforated, apparently incompletely, through its long axis. Unfortunately, Assigning a date to the seal stone is somewhat problematic, since very few comparable examples come from closely dated contexts, and many have no provenience at all. Nevertheless, it's clear that small amygdaloid talismanic seal stones are popular throughout the MM3 through LM1 period, especially in East Crete, and green jasper seal stones are generally rare in LM2 and LM3. We do have several close iconographic parallels, all of which have been assigned an LM1 date. As a result, we're comfortable assigning it to this period. Of note is the fact that two similar seal stones come from the area of Cavania, one from the cemetery of Moklos and one from an unknown location near Mirabella Bay. While a number of such items from the Richard B. Seeger bequest at the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art must have had a similar provenience. Another close example comes from further east at Satia while comparable crescent motifs appear on seal stones from other sites in central Crete, including Knossos, Episcopi Pediada, and Malia. Despite the brief amount of time that we've been able to spend in the field, in essence, two summers of two weeks each, we feel that the results that we've produced to date have more than justified our initial belief, and indeed that of others before us, that despite the absence of Saracen gold and the paucity of associated deaths, the promontory of Kovania hides a substantial and significant settlement worthy of exploration. Let me therefore finish today by highlighting three particular features that in our opinion highlight the importance of the site and demand further investigation. First, 
Although the bulk of our prehistoric ceramic uh, remains date to the protoplacial and neoplacial periods, there is clear indication for occupation as early as EM2 and as late as LM3B, not to mention, of course, the abundant historical activity. That is providing definitive support for the dates suggested by the Ephraim's initial excavations. This lengthy history of occupation, together with the fact that deposition reaches close to, if not more than two meters in places, makes it more than likely that systematic excavation will allow for the construction of a detailed and refined chronological sequence that promises to begin filling in a striking lacuna in the larger archeological landscape. That is the Western shores of the Bay of Mirabello, a lacuna that covers what must have been a key strategic position at the crossroads of several important communication routes connecting the north coast to the island's interior and south coast and its center to the eastern reaches. Second, despite the lengthy history of occupation and the absence of stratigraphic excavations, given their shared building techniques and contour-driven orientation, the vast majority of visible building remains would appear to belong to two broad architectural phases that we tentatively suggest equate with the neoplacial and postpalatial periods. The discovery of the LM2 Ephirian goblet stem then, together with the possible presence of additional LM3A1 shirred material from the surface, raises the fascinating and intriguing possibility that we have preserved at Cavania one of the few examples of post-LM1B destruction settlement continuity a possibility that we strongly believe merits further exploration. And third, though only partially revealed, the extant architectural remains suggest the presence of multiple structures of monumental quality that are indicative most likely of some sort of public or civic function. This tentative conclusion is supported not only by the extensive efforts undertaken to modify the natural landscape and the probable existence of an expansive street system, but also the presence of two ideal harbor locales that would only have served to enhance the already strategic location Havania occupies at the crossroads of intra-island exchange networks. The promise of exploring another coastal entrepot like Comos, Gornia, and Moklos, yet unlike those untouched archeologically and unobscured by later building activities, is surely too tantalizing to ignore. The already productive nature of research at the site, together with the overwhelmingly promising potential evident in its remains, indicates to us that Cavania demands systematic archaeological investigation, a demand made all the more pressing by the constant encroachment of property development and tourism that threatens to close the already narrow window onto this largely unexplored yet incredibly important region of Crete. On behalf of Matt, the rest of the team, and myself, I'd like to thank you all for listening to our talk this evening, and we look forward to sharing the results of our future research when they're ready. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rod, for a very detailed and interesting presentation. If anyone has a question or comment, please put your hand up and we'll get the microphone to you. Uh, I think I have two and a half questions. Two and a um, half questions. I think so. Okay. Well, the first question, obviously, is do you intend to dig there? But I think you kind of answered that. Um, second question, the second Ephraim excavation, obviously, from the, what the map showed, was meant to precede some kind of development, I reckon. Yes. Uh, is that happening? Uh, no. Uh, the trenches were opened because the landowners wanted to build a house there. Uh, the Ephraim found architectural remains, so they couldn't build a house. So is the site zoned? Yes. Okay. Uh, totally unrelated. What is, what is that bizarre structure in the Southern Harbor? Uh, it's part of the Wyndham Hotel. Right. Which Thank spreads you. like a virus across the, uh, across the area. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a mole. Uh, this is unrelated, but your map showed the Zerokombos cave. I thought it was right next to the sea. Uh, did I make a mistake on locating it? Yeah, uh, it looks like I did, judging from a head shape. 
Thank you for pointing out that I have not been able to find a location of any of those Minoan places. So I, I, I sorry? You were right. Oh, well, imagine that. Thank you very much, Rod. Um, I, I, th I think that I was shocked actually to hear that there are only very few shirts uh, that were identified as um, prehistoric. Uh, and um, I wonder, uh, I, I think this comes in somewhat contradiction with the, the fact that you're saying that the, the architecture there is uh, um, neo-palatial and post-palatial. I have no reason to doubt about this, no problem. But actually, I have excavated part of this uh, site in Andrew Dyke's like plot. So you there is... 2004, uh, uh, exactly. So there is uh, prehistoric material there. But in a way, perhaps you should find um, an interpretation of how you can uh, <laughs> interpret the fact that uh, so few shirts are uh, prehistoric. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you see the problem and if you have any way to, inter to, to understand why this happened with the surface material. Uh, so I think two responses. One is much of the shirt material is so heavily denuded that it was impossible to identify. Uh, second is that the 80 shirts represent shirts that Angus could actually give a date to. Uh, so that there is lots more prehistoric material. It's just that it couldn't be dated to any specific period, as far as I understand. Yeah, uh, I also had a question about these shirts because you had this zoning in like your survey survey areas, mm -hmm. but you didn't put the shirts back. No. So, w do you, can you tell actually where the majority of the LM1 shirts and the LM2 shirt come from? Uh, the LM2 shirt comes from right in the middle of building A. Okay. Uh, most, uh, uh, most of the neopalatial Because, material. I mean, the point is, of course, if all the Roman shirts are connected to one of these buildings, I mean, so it's like... Because my, my recollection yeah. is that the Roman shirts tend to be more peripheral. Okay. Uh, I, did I not show a plan of... Oh, I, I guess I took it out. We do know where the shirts are from, and we can okay. we can I don't think, locate areas. I don't think I saw that, but uh, so I think I, I took it uh, out. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. but yes, we can we can we we have a some idea of where the dated material comes yeah. from. I mean, that would make it easier to yeah. convince. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and the other thing is, you briefly mentioned mud brick. Yeah, because of course, if we think about the LM one B destruction, you would. It, assume like more general presence of like uh, fired mud brick yeah but can you say anything about that or? uh we ha so this is all on the surface no. uh we have not been able to look at the effria material no. so it is it's certainly possible that there's much more there that we just don't have access to mm -hmm. and can you actually uh identify obvious changes in masonry so that yes. you could say okay this could be like post manon historical and this could rather because i mean the yep. the big the first building you showed that really looked manon yeah so, uh, uh, so the vast majority of the architecture on and around the summit looks manon to us there is clearly one wall that was exposed in two different trenches on the south slope by the Afria uh, that postdates that. It, it, it's built above the Minoan, built, it's built above the first category. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's of a very, very different 
technique. It's just kind of small stones banged together, very, very wide. I, I, I don't know what it is, yeah. Uh, as you move down towards the north coast, there's a shift in orientation. There are also buildings underwater. Uh, my impression is that there's a lot of Hellenistic or Roman in the area. The buildings underwater, I think, are Hellenistic or Roman, and I think they continue on to the site, but they're built on a very different orientation. Hello, Rod. Thanks Hi, for that. Yeah. Uh, so my question is about the map you showed about uh, Cavagna being uh, theoretically a port for the other uh, place that you show along the coast and then you go inland to Plati and I yeah. may have missed this I'm not sure I've missed why you're connecting it to Plati is because of the spines you found no we're not suggesting Kavanya is the port of any of the sites on the map we're suggesting it's another port in this network of ports that interconnects all of these sites in the region in not only along the coast, not only up to the northwest, but also up to Lasithi. Oh, and Plati is just a random it's, it's, choice. Okay, it's a sorry. Minoan site up in, uh, up in Lasithi, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <coughs> I just put all the sites on the map that I personally want to excavate. That's what so. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Are there more well, if there are no more questions. <laughs> Uh, we can continue the discussion over a glass of wine in the adjoining rooms. Please join me in thanking Rod once again. <laughs>